Good morning. Uh, I'm happy to be here on behalf of the host country and tell you about something that's taken 40 years, in fact, almost 50, if you go back to where it began for me. So this is where it started for me. I was um, not here yet. I was just finishing a thesis in which I had discovered that hot O stars, massive O stars, were losing mass in what was subsequently called a stellar wind. At the same time, Don Morton had just obtained the rocket spectra that you see uh, in the far UV, and there revealed was stellar winds. You can see very strongly shifted absorption lines of the resonance lines in the far UV. And this showed that this kind of phenomenon was quite common uh, in massive hot stars. So at this point, I decided that space astronomy was where I wanted to be. This is the place where I can carry on the things that I had been working on. So in the meantime, what was going on here in Canada? Um, there were a number of things that began us uh, in the space activities. There had been uh, the rocket, Black Brand rocket program started way back when, and is still underway. Um, Canada became the third country in the world to launch a satellite. Um, and so we've been kind of dining out on this ever since. Canada was also the first country to establish a communication satellite network. Um, and so these are the things in ancient history that have been the precursor to many of the things that we've done. Um, the first astronomy thing that we seriously got into was a project called Star Lab. This was an imaging UV telescope that we were working on with uh, Canada and Australia. Unfortunately, it never flew. There was um, a withdrawal by one of the, the partners, and so we were uh, not particularly happy about that. But nevertheless, the work that went into that and the expertise and studies that were done uh, served us well and as we went forward. Then um, the big thing that our space agency is known for is the re remote manipulator system, the Canada arm that flew on the space shuttle and has flown on every shuttle mission. So that was the beginning for many of uh, Canadians knowing about what we did in space. The result of this was that uh, the US invited Canada to put some astronauts up there, maybe to help operate this thing from the shuttle. So this is a picture showing the first set of uh, astronauts that were selected from Canada. In those days, it was run by my uh, host in uh, institute, the NRC, and there they all are. Two of them much later became presidents of CSA. You can see who they are. Um, and finally, as a result of all of this uh, building up and, and continuing, the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, was formally established uh, in 1989, and since then has been the central organization for running space programs. So if you look through the CSA's archives, you find some of these bits of history uh, that I picked out as kind of related to astronomy. Um, not really indirectly. However, we did participate in the first um, orbiting radio telescope interferometry experiment, which uh, used the correlator system, which was developed um, at the NRC lab in Penticton. And, and that same correlator system has been developed and is applied in a number of radio telescopes around the world right now. Then, um, moving forward to 1999, we actually launched uh, a, a serious piece of space hardware into an astronomy mission, and I'll tell you more about that shortly. So here again is some of the ancient history of things that we did in space astronomy before CSA actually existed. 
So this goes back to the first OAO, the, the NASA Orbiting Astronomical Observatory. Um, that was uh, very exciting for many, many of us. It was the first time we had been exposed to serious survey data taken in the UV from space. And this was followed by the whole OAO series and one of those was Copernicus, which was a high-resolution far UV spectroscopic uh, mission. A number of us got involved with that on the Guest Observer Program and spent time going to Princeton uh, doing little programs that actually ran our observations on the satellite. Um, there, were, there was another one, the OAOB, which as many of you may know, never got into orbit. Um, and but prior to that, a number of us had applied for observing time and been granted observing time on the satellite. And this was kind of put on hold until a new satellite was, uh, was put up. That happened to be IUE. And IUE, as you all know, was one of the great successes of far UV astronomy. It was built for a three-year mission, lasted for 18, and served astronomers uh, in Europe and North America and around the world very well for a long time. And so uh, a number of us, of us Canadians were involved with doing observations on that. At the same time, uh, in those days, X-ray astronomy began. And the, the first X-ray catalog of observations in the sky, the Uhuru catalog, uh, led to a great deal of activity of people trying to identify these new sources in the sky, most particularly X-ray pulsars, because these had to be neutron stars. So there was a real, uh, what I re referred to and was, was known at the time as a rat race to try to identify these things from ground-based observations and try to figure out what it was they were doing. So a number of us, again, were involved in, in that activity. I'll show you a couple of details of that later. Um, in the 1970s, the HST began, and it was on an IUE shift that I actually joined the HST project. IUE was a great telescope. You'd go to the control center and actually point the thing around the sky in real time, get a finding chart, identify your object, and take a spectrum. It was just like being at the telescope. Things are not like that anymore. Anyway, we did spend a lot of time in the control center at Goddard, and at one of those times, uh, I was approached by a bunch of people at Goddard and uh, asked whether I'd like to join the instrument they, they were proposing for HST. Um, and so that's where that little saga began. Some years later, um, I was again in, in the IUE control room, and Bruce Woodgate came in and said the same thing. Would you like to join uh, a new proposal that we're putting together for the Space Telescope? And this is... Uh, gets us close to the theme of this meeting um, because that week a bunch of us sat in Bruce's office and sketched out what ultimately turned out to be this, this instrument that's still flying today. It was very close to, to what is really there. So um, these things actually do happen. Back in Canada, we had proposals um, prepared for a program called SISAT. And the proposal for astronomy that was put together was for an, a UV imaging telescope. We called it QVIT, Canadian UV Imaging Telescope. Uh, we came second in the selection, but I was advised by CSA to go find a partner who might like to um, collaborate and produce something like that. And that's led to what is now the UVIT project on the Astrosat, and I'll tell you a bit about that too. Um, then, later on, of course, the uh, NG, uh, NGST studies began, and we became involved in that, and, of course, that has resulted in our significant part participation in that mission. Okay, I'm almost done with the ancient history, but this is a velocity curve, radio velocity curve, of an, one of the X-ray objects that we were chasing up, LMC X3. As you can see, it, this is a B star which is being swung around at huge velocity 
by something you cannot see. And this was one of the uh, defining observations that really proved that there were uh, stellar mass black holes out there. There was something heavier than the star you can see uh, in orbit. Right, so moving on to the CSA itself. Here is my brief summary of everything you need to know about the CSA. First of all, we have no launch capability. So to begin with, everything we do needs a partner, at least a rocket to take it up there, to make it work. The result is that traditionally we have had always uh, particip participation in international missions, usually at the 5% level. This seems to be our standard participation level in many um, projects. It's true of uh, uh, JWST, for instance. We do have a useful range of hardware capabilities around the country which have been developed over time uh, in the things that I've been talking about. Um, so this began our participation in actually producing space hardware for astronomy. Meantime, actual scientists, uh, individual scientists around the country were doing space astronomy by applying for time on open facilities such as HST, Chandra, and so forth, and still do. We have been fairly successful in proposing uh, good observations and getting good experience with uh, space data that way. Um, CSA have a program of doing small things. Uh, not just small fractions of a, of a big mission, but small things all by themselves. And so they have microsats and even smaller devices, and I'll show you a bit about that in a minute. Um, basically, our expenditure, CSA's expenditure on space astronomy, um, is not big. And over the past decade, I estimate it's been at about $10, $15 million a year. Most of that has been on our JWST instrumentation, and everything else is quite a bit smaller. We do have a decadal plan in Canada called the Long Range Plan. It came out in 2010, and as in the case of the US plan, our top space priority for astronomy is a dark energy mission. That again men means uh, we find a place where we can partner with a larger agency in such a mission. But that has also spawned an idea which I'll tell you a bit more about, and there have been some presentations already at this meeting, of a Canadian-led telescope called Castor, uh, which will do or support a lot of dark energy science. So the final thing is that we have undergone, or CSA has undergone, a number of quite hurtful and severe budget cuts in recent years. These are hurting our capability for the future, and some of us are working very hard to amend that and improve the situation. So here is FUSE. This is the Far Ultraviolet Spectroscopic Explorer. This began in 1981, very shortly after IUE was launched. NASA said, we've got to think about the next thing right away. And so we were talking about getting back to the far UV with better capability and sensitivity than had been done before. This project floated around the world. It became an ESA proposal at one time. Australia was involved. And so we were chasing each other um, with different designs and ideas for a number of years before it finally settled down to being the NASA FUSE project that flew. Yeah, it was launched in 1999 and was terminated in 08. The three-year initial primary mission was extended significantly. It was very successful. It produced many high-resolution far UV spectra covering many different topics of science. Uh, the Canadians' uh, participation, uh, it, as counted in papers, was quite good. We produced 87 papers out of the 442 refereed papers that came out of the mission, so that's quite good. Our contribution there was the FES finer sensor cameras for the mission, which provided the fine guiding capability, and that somehow became uh, our niche, and so we are 
the guided provider. We provide the guiders for James Webb Telescope as well. Um, so, moving on. These are some examples of the, the spectra that uh, the FUSE project produced. Very high, beautiful resolution spectra down in the far UV. This is a range that's way below what HST can use, but very rich in uh, spectroscopic features, both interstellar medium and high ionization features from uh, spectra of stars and active galaxies. So uh, this is a very rich uh, database, and the archive resides now in uh, several places, and you can still access them and do work with them. Now to the microsat. This is the all-Canadian astronomy satellite, MOST. And that flew in 2003. It is now being wound down this year, and uh, operations will cease in September. Uh, there's a summary of all the things it did. It basically looks at one star at a time very carefully and with great precision, mapping or following the photometric variations and there are all kinds of interesting stellar science or even transit, uh, uh, transits by planets that can be followed in this way. Uh, the, the PI of this mission, Jamie Matthews, some of you may know, is a fairly uh, characterful character, uh, and he always referred to this thing as the humble space telescope. Uh, not particularly humbly, I might add. Anyway, there are some of the details of what that, hap what that was all about. But wait, we do th even smaller things, nanosats. So there is a thing called the Bright Constellation, which is now underway. These are uh, small versions of the same idea. It is monitoring uh, bright stars for uh, fine photometric changes over long periods of time. So that gives the description of what it is we're after. This is a collaboration with uh, Austria and Poland, although CSA is the main partner here. Uh, it is a set of six satellites. Um, four of them are up there now. In fact, the last two were launched only a few days ago, 19th of June. And so um, I don't know much more except that they are up there. And I presume if we had heard there was any bad news, we'd know by now. Um, so again, that's what uh, this is all about, and it's all looking at bright stars for very long times. On to Astrosat. This is the collaboration that's now underway with the Indian Space Research Organization. They have a multi-wavelength satellite called Astrosat. Uh, in this session later this morning, you can hear an invited talk about that whole facility. Um, what we are doing is providing the photon counting UV detectors for the UV telescopes, which are set in the middle there. The rest of the instruments are X-ray telescopes of various types, soft X-rays, proportional counter, hard X-rays, and a sky monitor. All of the pointed instruments look at the same thing in the sky, and so you can do multi-wavelength observations um, using all of the instruments at once. So here's the detail of the UV telescopes. There are two of them. They're 40 uh, centimeter aperture. Uh, one of them has an FUV, far UV uh, channel only, and the other two uh, have a beam splitter which separates the near UV and blue optical. Each of those uh, channels has a set of filters, and the UV channels has gratings. Uh, so it's a fairly powerful facility. And there at the bottom on the right, you see a kind of blow up version of the detector systems that we provided for all of these uh, channels. This is what the, the flight hardware looks like. There on the bottom left, there are two, the two flight telescopes ready to go. They get bound together and mounted in the spacecraft. They're actually in the clean room waiting integration right now. Uh, on the top, you see the jig that was used by our contractors to put together the actual um, detector hardware. Here's a scene um, where the integration takes place at the clean room in the lab in Bangalore, in India, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, who are the 
the host institution for the UVA telescopes. And so I've spent a fair amount of time sitting in that room. Here is um, a, a brief example of what UVIT is capable of doing. There is the field of view. It's almost half a degree across. The spatial resolution is about one arc second, which is a factor of several better than the resolution of GALAX, which is the uh, survey instrument that NASA flew and uh, produced maps of the sky in the UV. So this is a very good follow-up of of UVIT, it, uh, of the GALAX, it has filters, higher resolution, and gratings to add power to the investigations that we are currently planning. Here you can see the field of view imposed upon the local galaxies M33 and M31, which is going to be one of the first observations that we do. So the next one, and again, you've all heard quite a bit about this at the meeting here, so um, I will not go into too many details, but we are partnering in this big, exciting telescope. And what we're doing is as follows. We're providing the fine guidance sensor cameras. There are two of them. They're independent and redundant because this is an essential uh, performance feature for the telescope to work. And we are providing a science instrument, which is called NIRIS. Uh, initially, that was part of the NIRCAM instrument and was proposed as part of it at the time that it all began. Things happened in the meantime, and the decision was made some years back to put all the Canadian hardware in the same box. And so we have an optical bench uh, which is populated on two sides. On the one side is the guided cameras, on the other side is our science instrument. Uh, the nearest instrument has a number of different unique capabilities. Um, we can do deep near infrared imaging in the same kind of channels as the near cam, and this, uh, in effect, increases the power of the telescope by um, quite a bit. We also have GRISMs, which are able to do detections uh, of looking specifically for Lyman alpha emitters at high redshift uh, anywhere in the sky, and we're planning observations looking at lensing clusters so that we can get the advantage of this and find faint uh, high redshift objects anywhere they may lie in those fields. There is a special GRISM which is designed for uh, getting spectra of transiting exoplanets, and that, as you all know, has become a uh, a growth field in recent years, and so this is a, a capability of considerable interest. So at the bottom there, I will not go through all of that uh, word by word, but uh, you may have been reading it anyway. These are the details of the things we're doing and who's doing it. Uh, we also have, um, we're providing the project historian, Robert Smith, who shows up at a number of meetings. Uh, he's very bored when things are going smoothly, and when there are big problems, he's writing lots of notes and looking quite happy. Good stuff for the book. So here's the, uh, the sky, as viewed by JWST. Um, you can see where our instruments lie towards the edge of the field there, but uh, we populate quite a bit of the real estate of the sky that the telescope looks at. Here are pictures of the actual instrument. Uh, we see the, uh, the full instrument package populated on top and bottom of the, the optical bench there. And we see uh, one of the contractor workers praying before the Bible, apparently, as far as I can tell. Uh, we have a non-redundant aperture mask, which is another unique feature there. It, it provides that set of apertures uh, through the telescope and gives us, in principle, the highest possible spatial re resolution that you can get by essentially by aperture synthesis um, or through the aperture of the, tel the telescope. Here is the, uh, the central double uh, filter wheel of our instrument, which contains all of these parts and filters that I've been talking about. And here is an illustration of the uh, exoplanet transit spectroscopy capability we have. We have, um, there's your illustration. You can see uh, transits. You can see light that is 
refracted through the atmosphere, if there is one, of the transiting exoplanet. And of course, the planet goes around the far side, and that changes the spectrum too. The spectrum is broadened by means of a cylindrical lens, as you can see there, to cover a large number of pixels and give us very high signal to noise um, in, in looking for these very faint spectroscopic traces. So there's a lot of planning of uh, uh, fun science that's going on using this piece of equipment. Here is uh, the, the, our team spread across the country, uh, spread across several countries actually, because we have t uh, team members in the US and in Europe too, and we similarly have members in other teams, so there's a lot of cross-fertilization going on. Here is the, the team with our instrument. It's in a clean room at the back there. I've got the arrow pointing so you can see where it is. That was uh, at the shipping uh, ceremony before we sent it off to NASA. And here it is at the ceremony where a bunch of us were writing uh, little nice messages on the box. And below you can see them unpacking it at NASA. Other things we've done, and I need to uh, speed up a bit here because uh, time's running out, but we have had scientific and a bit of hardware and software participation in the Herschel Planck missions. Uh, it's described there. We've had people involved. A number of Canadian scientists have been uh, doing great science with these um, missions and are still busy with them. So we have cosmic background radiation people and we have all kinds of infrared astronomy uh, programs going on. Here is a poster on one of the, the Herschel instrument um, papers that came out. Actually, this is by one of the grad students that we have in Victoria, Sarah Sadaboy. And here's a kind of illustration of the, the sort of thing we've been involved with. These are maps you've all seen. Uh, the, some of the software we've been working on developing has uh, helped towards this effort. Also, the, uh, we've, we've got this balloon program and the, the BLAST um, telescope, where I've corrected the spelling there, has been a precursor to the Herschel instrument that was um, useful in setting up the experiment and designing the science. This is for the future. We're looking for more balloon flights. We have an agreement uh, for a regular program of balloon flights with the French CNES agency. And we have the astronomy, the Canadian Astronomy Data Center, who was set up initially as the one of three archives for the HST database. And there's a lot of words there and not a lot of minutes left, so I'm going to keep rushing through. There is where CADC data flows for the past year. You can see we have customers and people downloading data from pretty much everywhere. That's what they do. They have cloud storage. Uh, we have a lot of clouds in Canada, so this is a good thing. Um, and that's all the boring details of what CADC is actually all about. There are 22 people doing it, and some of them are in this room, so I better not say anything too rude about them. Finally, the Castor. This is this uh, Canadian-led proposal that uh, we're talking about at this meeting. It's a one meter class aperture imaging telescope in the far UV, or the near and far UV, with uh, image quality of about 0.15 arc seconds. And that is uh, high resolution, and it is going to be uh, a killer for uh, supporting dark energy missions by means of um, uh, getting the, the photo redshifts as accurate as they need to be, and producing a vast amount of legacy science, as you can imagine. Uh, as you're all familiar with the power of the HST in this arena. Here is the field of view of Castor. It's very big, and it's compared there with the HST field, uh, which has similar resolution. So what's in the future? We've heard, talked about most of these things at this meeting. There are individual papers on all of them. These are the things we're working at right now. These are the things we hope to do and the status that they have. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a budget issue, and we need to get money to do all the things that we want. And um, I'm working on it, and so are some other people. Sanity check. Here is the official CSA slide on what we're doing. I think I've covered most of it, so I'm doing okay. And that's it. <laughs>